What did we used to believe on how you physically built a startup? What was the process we used? We used to build startups by managing processes. We said, well, hey, we understand how to build products. We build them exactly like we build them in large companies. We hire product managers, and we do something called waterfall engineering, which I'll explain in a second, which basically are step by step by step. In fact, what we used to do is we used to draw this diagram on napkins. We used to say, well, you come up with a concept, then you raise some seed funding, and then you go into product development, and then you have alpha test, beta test, and first customer ship. What could be wrong with that? That's, in fact, for 30, 40 years, this was the canonical model for how to build startups. And we'd say marketing, well, we understand. Well, engineering is developing the product. Marketing is creating all the marketing communications material and you know, hiring a PR agency and creating early buzz. And then for marketing, the world's most fun job was have the party. You get to create demand by having a launch event and you think about branding. And your job really was to create end user demand and drive it into the potential sales channel. For sales, what that meant is, unless the VP of sales was a founder, you tended to hire them around the time engineering was saying, uh, we're in alpha and beta test, and they were going out and starting to hire their first sales staff, and they were looking at your five-year revenue plan, and since it was obviously came from a burning bush, and it was the word of God, they were just going to execute that plan. Why? Because it said so, and you know, and you said so, and if you had investors, they said so. There might not be any facts behind it, but there it was. It was the spreadsheet. And so they were building the sales organization. So again, at that first customer ship, if marketing was going to drive demand, they were just going to have a sales curve that took off because the revenue plan said so. The next piece was the biz dev group. And business development used to mean the group that put together all the deals to create the whole product, W-H-O-L-E. The whole product meant startups, just because of their size, are incapable of creating all the features and, and services, etc., that a mainstream customer might need. So why don't we hire business development people to do partnerships so at first customer ship, we could look like a large company for mainstream customers. The only fallacy in this is that you assume that your first customers are going to be in the mainstream. It turns out for most startups, your first customers are actually crazy people like you. And so therefore, creating this entire cloud of deals are actually useful a year after first customer ship, but in fact, just get in your way on day one. The other piece is engineering. And engineering, how simple could that be? It was understood. We did exactly what we did in large corporations. You wrote a market requirements document, then engineering shut their doors, rolled up their sleeves, and went into waterfall engineering, which we'll describe a little later, you hired a QA department, then at the end, finally when it was all done, you hired a tech pubs department, and all the product was ready to go in version 1.0, all the features at one time at first customer ship. And this, for 30 or 40 years, was the way we thought about startups. There can be no other way. This is how we manage the process. We now know this is just simply wrong. And I'll explain to you uh, what we're going to do instead. If you remember, I said engineering was doing waterfall development. Waterfall development is just a step-by-step -step process that says we marketing rights requirements of what the product should do. Engineering takes that and translates that into features. Engineering then designs the product, either codes it or builds the hardware. They test it, and they maintain it. And this is kind of a waterfall life cycle, step-by-step. -step. But if you really look at this, there's an implicit fallacy that no one ever noticed for 40 years. To write the requirements and do the design assumes on day one you know the problem or need the customer has. Well, let me say it again. Waterfall development assumes you understand the customer problem and need on day one. Now, in a large company, with existing customers, existing products, existing sales channel, you know what? This might actually be true. But in most startups, all you have is the founder's vision. And what you tend to do in a startup is confuse a faith-based vision with customer facts about problems and needs. And what happens? The consequence of assuming you know the customer problem means you assume you know every possible feature to ship on day one. So therefore, you shut the door and you start implementing. 
And instead of just implementing a piece at a time, you actually implement every possible feature you could think about for version 1.0. The irony is that we now know somewhere between 85 and 90 percent of most software product features are unwanted and unneeded by customers. That's an enormous amount of waste of time and money that ends up on the floor. We now know that waterfall and product management execution on two knowns uh, is just kind of the wrong way to approach it in a startup. Makes all the sense in the world in a large company. What we now know is most startups fail from a lack of customers than from a failure of product development. And that's really interesting. Even in Silicon Valley, where we probably take more technical risk per square inch or square foot than anywhere else in the world. We go out of business typically not because we didn't deliver a product. We go out of business because we didn't find enough customers to pay us enough money. That's a big idea. Because if you think about it, we have all these processes to manage the engineering process. Why? Because that is the biggest risk in a large company. But we had no processes to manage the customer risk. In fact, the best we could do is in, in the old days is hire a VP of sales who told you, oh, I have a great Rolodex or a great set of contacts. But we really had no formal process for searching for what customers' needs are. And in fact, we've just come up with one. And that's going to be a key part of this course. This search for the business model, this search for the truth is called customer development. And customer development really has two pieces the search and its execution. And in this class, we're going to be talking about the first two steps, customer discovery, customer validation, the pivots that connect them. And then if you're so lucky, we actually get to execute your business model in customer creation and company building. The other piece that goes with the process in a startup is not only the customer development process, but an agile engineering process. One example is uh, Extreme Programming, or XP, uh, which basically is built around this idea of iteration and incremental delivery of the product. This is a big idea. It says instead of building every possible feature on day one, we're actually going to incrementally and iteratively interact with customers, test each portion of the product, and see if what we're building actually has a home outside the building. So what this really means is that for process, Instead of just going to execution first, hiring product managers, doing waterfall development, or maybe even Agile nowadays, we're actually going to start with a customer development process coupled with some kind of Agile engineering process. Which one you pick, I use XP as an example, but it could be whatever your favorite process is. And by the way, don't only think that Agile engineering, Agile development is about software. Toyota and the Toyota production system actually had it for hardware decades before anybody in software ever, ever thought about it. So you could be building products, anything from microprocessors to medical equipment to uh, hardware, software, etc., using an iterative and incremental engineering process. And again, once you're done with that, of course you want to manage this in a formal process, but not before you do the planning. So why do startups fail? Well, the answer is really all of the above. Co-founders do fight. Somewhere between a quarter and a third of startups never even get to the beginning of the company because the founders just couldn't agree. Two is that sometimes your vision is just too far in advance to actually be built. Or three is it's such an interesting vision or such a bad vision, but it can't attract sufficient capital to get started. And it's maybe too expensive to fund on your own or through your own resources. And the one we'll be actually talking about in some detail uh, during these series of lectures is that you never actually found product market fit. That is, too few people will buy or will use the product. Now the last interesting thing that's a holdover from thinking about startups as smaller versions of large companies is kind of the hardest to get your head around. And that's large companies, they have VPs of sales. Well, we need a VP of sales on day one. Large companies, they have heads of marketing. I need a head of marketing. In large companies, they have BizDev and all those external organizations. We need those too. Without ever thinking about what's the point, why is it that we want to duplicate these same organizations? Because if you're a founder like I was, boy, you really want someday to see you on top and look at all these nice silos working for me. Isn't this great? And look, they're all doing their jobs, etc. 
I have to tell you, if this is your vision on day one, you are already out of business. Because we now know that functional organizations actually are the wrong way to set up sales marketing and biz dev on day one. What we now know is that the founders need to run what's called the customer development team. And a customer development team says, listen, we're not going to have sales marketing and biz dev on day one. We're not going to hire a VP of sales on day one. We're actually going to have the founder get out of the building. And later in this lecture, we'll explain why. It's a really big idea to understand for organization, you need the founders spending at least 20% of their time outside the building understanding customers' problems and needs and figuring out how that matches with the feature set you're building before you start organizing in functional organizations and silos. The other thing I'll mention, which I'll uh, expand on later in this course, is that one of the mistakes that we've also made for decades is confusing the titles, sales marketing and biz dev, with the job specifications. It turns out that the title, VP of Sales, has a very different job spec in a large company than it does in a startup. A VP of Marketing does very different things in a large company than they do in a startup. And for years we could never explain why is it that incredibly competent executives who've been executing, executing business models in large corporations collapse in startups when their company is smaller than their administrative staff in their large corporation. It turns out the job specification, what we do day to day, has nothing similar. So let's just take a look at the last piece, which is why you're here. How do we teach entrepreneurship? Well, in the past, entrepreneurial education was about execution. We're going to teach you how to write a business plan. We're going to teach you how to put together the PowerPoint for the VC presentation, where if we're doing it really well, we'll have you do lots of research. But it really assumed it was all about execution. What we now know, that's just simply not the case. Entrepreneurial education, the reason why you're taking this class, is about the search for the business model. And we're going to teach you how to search. And so for that, what that means about entrepreneurial education is that eventually we do need you to know everything an MBA knows. Eventually, if you're successful, in growing your startup into a large company, you are going to need to know about accounting and HR and organizational behavior and global leadership and etc. But at first you need a different set of skills that just never existed before. And so welcome to the first class of its type that's going to put search first. And that's a radical change. It's not just one more methodology. So this class is going to teach you all the skills about strategy and process and organization. And eventually, if you build a successful company, will then allow you to write the plans and operating documents and financial spreadsheets to actually execute the company. So hold on to your seats. We're about to get started. And let's jump into business models and customer development. So what can happen to a startup? Well, the best thing that can happen to a startup is that it can grow into a company, and hopefully a large company, after you've found a repeatable and scalable business model. Or two is, you could still be pivoting and iterating as you continue to search for a business model. Or three is, you could have found a business model, uh, but maybe one that isn't an explosive growth, but you could be growing slowly and barely breaking even. Or four is, maybe you never found a business model that uh, can make money and you ran out of money and time, uh, and you shut your company down. So the answer is all of the above. 